Hey everybody, um, essentially today's session is about 90 minutes on case development, as you know. Uh, before we go on to explain to you what case development is, uh, a couple of things. Right? First and foremost, uh, so we have a seven point plan. Um, we're being quite adventurous in what we think we can cover. Uh, we will cover it, uh, but we will need your help on it. So like, uh, we'll tri obviously be pushing this at the time, but we can, we can do it, we will do it. Because we essentially want to give you as much as we possibly can in this like relatively short session. Uh, before I go on to explain what the purpose of the session is, uh, just a brief introduction uh, of ourselves. Uh, so, my name is Stephen. I have uh, quite a lot of experience in KP and PP format. Um, so, in KP, uh, final at uh, KPDC, finished top speaker there. Uh, at BP, a final at the competition, broken at Euros and Cambridge and UKDC, and stuff like that. So, um, that's my background in debate. Uh, well, Hi everybody, I'm Warren Allen from Croatia Zagreb. Uh, I also have experience in the uh, high school debate as well as public policy, public policy, and law schools, and as well as American presidential debate and uh, British parliamentary, uh, work of the world's ESL and stuff like that. So I think we as a team will give you a lot of good information. Right? Yeah, Ace. Hey, so that's us. So first and foremost, right, what, what do we want you guys to get from the session? Right? How do we see this working? So, Case development, to be honest, is like much like a lot of them, are, is like a rather vague term. Um, it, it covers like a whole host of things. Uh, but what we want to get out of this session, first and foremost, is um, understand to begin with like what level you guys are at, at the moment. But then go on to explain one, like the most important thing I think we, we both agree in BP debate to do well, which is understanding what burdens are and understanding how you meet those burdens, right? So I'll cover that, we'll cover that later. Essentially, a burden is like, how do you win the debate? What do you need to prove in order to win the debate? So that's what we're gonna teach you first and foremost. Then we're gonna teach you how to use that in order to develop your case, right? So unlike in, say, KP debate, uh, there's a very big difference in the different positions, right? So your case in opening government is drastically different to how you develop a case in closing opposition. We're going to do our very best uh, to explain to you what those differences are and how you can use that to your advantage. Um, and, and the final thing we want to have cover within that is just like to get you guys having some experience in building faces, right? To be honest, that's going to be something we're not going to have that much time on doing, but we will try to push for that as well. Um, so are there any questions on the schedule? No, eggs. Um, before we go on, just a quick idea of understanding what level you guys are at. So can, if you, can you put your hands up if you've uh, debated any British parliamentary, which hopefully should be everyone. Um, brilliant. Um, so just to make sure, is there anyone who hasn't debated any BP? That would be a better question. No, nice. Cool. So is, is anyone unfamiliar with the four roles, like how like the debate pans out? No? Nice. Great. So let's get cracking, right? Um, we know it's early, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a warm-up exercise. So we're going to split into two groups. So I'll take a group into a corridor, um, and Borna will keep 14 of you here. So we're just going to do this in a very arbitrary way of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. If you come with me, we're going to go to the corridor. We'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and it should leave you with... Okay, everybody, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have an element. Uh, this uh, means we're going to split up in two groups. We're going to have uh, a motion on the floor, and you, everybody's going to have an argument and a rebuttal from the other side coming and an argument. And the first guy will probably do a rebuttal the same way as the last guy. Or the second the last guy will be, well, can do only a rebuttal, but an extra argument would be nice. Only to see how guys you're flowing around. This, this is about case development, so that means we have to prep you. Uh, well, for the fact that in BP you have only 15 minutes to prepare, plus in certain cases if you're anything than the first government, you maybe have less, but five minutes to prepare. So, um, I don't know, how are we going to sit? How are we going to sit? Uh, how, how <laughs> oh, excuse me. That's good. We, we need you. You're the 12th man. So can we sit, sit like six here and six here? Can we sit here? Yeah, let's give you some, uh, I don't know, some old school cliche debate like, um, this house would ban capital punishment. You know, that's a Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you 
all of you, I'm going to give you like three minutes, three minutes, Captain, and in three minutes uh, you will start. You guys are for the capital punishment. No, banning. Okay. Uh, We're for banning. You're for banning the capital punishment. You're for letting the state believe. In three minutes, we're going to start. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, it's exact. Fist cross. First you, then you, then you, then you, then you, then you, then you. Then you. Your speeches will last, uh, what time? Let's, let, let's give you uh, a minute. For now. A minute, a minute, a minute, 15 maybe. You got three minutes. But of course, I don't want arguments to repeat itself that much. So the guys that are coming later are going to have a tougher job. But that's the whole thing. To be honest, they don't have to be really serious. Not all of the arguments. If you have nothing serious to say, you can say a funny thing, but maybe an argument. So you have to <coughs> cover the argument. The opposition has um, just told us, and uh, then you have to put on a new one. Yeah. So in total, you have to you know, like, deal with two arguments. Yes, exactly. Okay. Only so it's not about really yeah. going to death, it's just more realizing what was the argument for you, giving an um, First, first response uh, rebuttal on it, and then give us something new like more of an introduction than actually uh, rebuttal. But no worries, it works okay. We just want to get you in that frustrating mode of, of not being not being able to think of anything like that's a great place to start. Shall we go? Yeah, no, let's go, guys. Uh, wait, does anybody guys know? Do you have, do you, do you have a final shot? Yes. Just have to shut my. Now I will show you why the banning of the capital punishment is the right thing to do. 
my first argument and uh, my argument is that uh, banning the capital punishment will uh, give us uh, will give us a space to, for correcting the uh, uh, mistakes of the law system. Firstly, we are saying that uh, with a lot of decisions that with reopening the cases with uh, new exploration with new uh, view on the cases, we are seeing the different results. We are seeing the uh, for most uh, new technologies that will lead to the different kind of conclusions that can uh, save human life. And, th uh, and for this facts, we are um, we are uh, aiming to the optimal optimal um, optimal law uh, object object objectivity, and uh, we'll find the the real uh, the real criminals and the real um, the victims will go to the data data set. And, and that's why um, I don't know the new technology will. Uh, give us new uh, opportunities for uh, exploring and uh, giving different view on the cases. Uh, for I don't know, for example, DNA tests they were explored, uh, giving uh, were uh, bring us a lot of different conclusions and a lot of different facts in the cases. And that's why uh, banning the capital punishment will uh, lead us to the uh, open to the space for. Correcting the mistakes of the laws. Thank you very much, Mark. That's a good, reasonable argument to be starting the uh, government's case. Uh, moving on with the opposition. So ready? <laughs> okay. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alisson. And first, I want to say what we heard from a team of, of uh, proposition of first government team. Uh, I want to say that uh, new technologies is. Uh, it's a system which, which is developing in a long time, and the society uh, don't want to wait for to for punish for bad bad people uh, which 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 are killer and which are which are really bad. The, the society don't want to wait for new technologies for save save some some lives. And also, I want to say that the cases of the, uh, the, the we 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 see only a few cases of the people uh, who who are waiting. Who are, who are waiting for the new technologies to save their lives. So uh, we, we, if we, we take the time, we can save so many lives. So this is the first point that I want to say uh, for, the, for the team of the, of the proposition. And uh, my, my argument is that uh, capital punishment yeah, is, the, is, the, is the punishment which make, makes some kind of fear in society. And uh, so society will see that uh, that we I, I can't kill someone because I will die. And and we in, in real life we, we don't need to kill some people, but this fear can make uh, uh, can can make a uh, uh, better society. So because of, I want to say that capital punishment should be legal. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got the opposition start off. contributing to, for example, lowering the, the criminal rate in this country, which means that this does not play any kind of fear vector because we still have a um, high criminal rate. And now I would, to, uh, I would like to talk about um, another argument why we should ban the capital punishment, and it is because we believe that every person has a debt to pay to the society, but this debt does not have to be uh, made through the capital punishment, but we believe that the society is able to make pre-socialization um, uh, of uh, these people into the society. For example, if they're still in jail, that means that they can still contribute to the society through, through work, through socialization. But there are also psychologists who work with them, which means that maybe, even though maybe they have made serious crimes, but they can maybe uh, after a lot of years of socialization and after a lot of years of contributing to the society, maybe, maybe they can go uh, back to normal, for example. But we still believe that we can pull out everything we can from every person. This is why we do want to keep them alive. So, uh, because we will, we believe that every person is able to make a great contribution to society, no matter whether in uh, in jail or not. We believe that the capital punishment should not be banned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll go back to the opposition side.
So what is it, gentlemen? I would like to repeat what was were said. So we were talking about our fear that that uh, people should be motivated. They they uh, uh, couldn't understand something which which is too wrong to be killed. So this is this is fear which motivated, which makes a positive attitude for uh, because to this to this uh, thing to this to this uh, criminal act. So I think that, okay, we have some new technologies, we have some resociations. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good for, for other criminals, for criminals who probably still have stolen something, or who probably have uh, still had some, have, uh, something bad done. But when someone uh, has someone killed brutally, and killed probably uh, more than 10 uh, people, probably there, there are some terrorists, there are some people who killed a big amount of people. There must be a fear that stopped them to, to do these things. I, I, I don't talk that everybody who, who has uh, killed someone should be uh, sent to capital punishment. But this fear motivates it, these people. So I think it's a really great solution. I think I, well, my, my argument is that uh, there should be some uh, equivalent between uh, act and between punishment. When someone kills a big amount of people, it's, I think it's kind of equal to kill one people, one, one man. So it's kind of equal uh, punishment, and it's, mo it's motivating for them. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, excellent, and we're continuing on. Okay. Um, now I'd like to repeat the argument the uh, opposition presented us. They said that actually, um, Killing uh, uh, the capital punishment will stop uh, uh, serial, serial killers and terrorists from doing such acts. But in real life, we know that serial killers are people that have some kind of a problem, or terrorists are people that have some kind of an ideology standing behind them. So that means that no fear or no punishment in the world would ever ever stop these people from doing so. Uh, speaking of the terrorists, and about the serial killers, we know that they're um, actually sociopaths and psychopaths which need to be taken care of in the resocialization institutions that the jail provides them. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to refer to my argument that actually this is the old approach uh, towards punishing, uh, punishing uh, prisoners. The thing is that um, the principle I for an eye is a very old principle and it is uh, it's based in the primitive, the primitive law and it's, um, the, uh, it's uh, a non-democratic non way of punishing, uh, non-democratic way of punishing. And as we've shown you that actually this, um, this, um, uh, the, uh, the, the banning, of, uh, non -ban uh, the banning of the capital punishment is more beneficial than not banning it with uh, the, uh, with uh, the resocialization factors, and because it uh, makes no fear in the people, we believe that you should vote for the opposition. Thank you. Okay, 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 okay. Over the setting and uh, moving on. The third speaker of the opposition. Okay, hello, my name is Galin and I'm going to speak about the, what the proposition say today. And we talk about the new technology they have and I think that brings us the solution for having the more accurate sentences and we can surely have more uh, good uh, punishments from that new technology. And more on that, uh, we uh, surely think that we should put this uh, capital punishment only on very severe crimes and very hard crimes. And as a response of uh, my uh, antecedent speaker, we say that we believe in equality between punishment and act, and we have a, a really bad act, we should have a really bad punishment, punishment because this is equality between people. And if uh, he uh, or she had a very uh, wrong uh, attitude that killed a lot of people, he should be killed otherwise. This is how we treat it fair and this is why we should have a capital punishment. And as my argument, I believe in economical situations and I see that prisons are full, are full of people committing bad crimes and this uh, will help uh, us uh, having uh, less people in prisons. This will help us uh, to get some money back because if you have some people in prison, they are uh, getting their treatment that costs a lot, they are getting their uh, food and also a lot of stuff that uh, man needs, and that costs a lot. 
we should uh, cut off these costs by having this management. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very reasonable on the amendment of the opposition, the economic argument appears. That's good, that's good. We have more arguments, more and more arguments. Go. Okay, so what we heard from the previous speaker is that actually we cannot uh, punish, we, we must have a different imprisonment or different punishment for different crimes. So that's why they believe that people who committed harder crimes should have actually uh, capital punishment. But in the law system, when we don't have capital punishment, we still have measures to actually put people who commit uh, harder crimes into imprisonment for more years. So actually, this in law systems where we don't have um, capital punishment, this problem is actually solved. So I would like to refer to actually what was already said from our side and kind of develop it more. So what we were actually saying is that this is a primitive system. And they were talking, uh, before they were talking about the fear factor that actually the crime punishment is doing. But I believe that this is actually pressuring its citizens because the government is giving a picture to its citizens that even for the little, I don't even, for every mistake that they're going to make, they should pay with their life. And we know that most of the countries right now are actually trying to develop more and more democratic values. And by having this, uh, cap by having the capital punishment, we believe that this is kind of a uh, this is kind of a uh, obstacle obstacle for those uh, values to be achieved. And this is why we believe that actually every uh, country should be that should be trying to uh, create a more. Uh, a better environment for its citizens and actually be uh, uh, trying to have more democratic values. And this is why we believe that capital punishment is not going to achieve those values. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to rebut uh, what the proposition to call us today. Well, they said that we live in a political system. For, for one of us, we know that in a democratic society today, that we live in a liberal system, which is confronted by the security measures that the state must must take into consideration in order to protect our own liberties. For that matter, we believe that by killing those who deserve it, who killed massive people, who killed massive numbers of people, the state is actually showing to those who do not commit crimes, those people who are good people and those who, who respect the laws, the state is showing them they do that they protect them, that they protect them, that they, they take measures in order to protect their own liberties, and they take measures in order to protect their own lives. So according to our argument, we believe in the in the in the principle of retribution, one retribution for whole society, and second of all, retribution for families. To the whole society, so the previous you that we live in a period where we have so many restrictions in our liberties, that we have so many restrictions that the state is telling us that we need to have them in order to protect our liberties, in order to protect our lives, our security, our, uh, in order to protect the main, our families. So in order to in order to pay us back with these restrictions, in order to pay us back that in order for us to know that we're living in those the restrictions, the state must show us how they actually punish those people who hurt us. In the other hand, they state they have to show to the families. In, in one hand, that they that the, the state is uh, taking some measures to, to give them retribution, taking some measures uh, to to show them that the state actually cares about them because these families deserve the deserve the ones who killed uh, the, the ones who killed their sons or daughters or brothers to pay for what they did. Thank you. Uh, moving on back to the government side. Okay, first I'm going to rebut what the previous speaker said and then I'm going to come up with a new argument. Well, uh, basically, <coughs> their argument was about retribution as a principle, and our side actually believes that retribution as a principle is okay, but we have never heard from them why exactly this measure, why exactly the capital punishment should be the kind of retribution that people in the society deserve. So basically, we believe that retribution should be made, but no, but uh, by the capital punishment. And I will later explain why my argumentation. We believe that there are other measures which satisfy and are proportional to the uh, crimes that were committed, like for example the life sentence. Uh, so uh, to conclude, we believe that retribution is okay, but we have never heard why exactly with the capital punishment, uh, which, uh, as previously explained, is inhumanly degrading, etc. So to go on with my argument, uh, actually I would like to point out the difference between all of the other measures and the capital punishment. We do know and we are aware of the fact that no law is 100% effective, especially the criminal law. Sometimes we can see innocent people who are being, led, uh, who are being punished. Uh, the difference between all of the other punishments and the capital punishment is that actually this punishment is irreversible. And in case uh, we have some mistake in the jurisdiction or etc., uh, uh, we are making such a great, uh, you know, we're, we're making uh, uh, such a great harm that actually it cannot be 
uh, let down by. And it is only it is enough for only one person to be wrongly executed for all the people in the country to actually receive this message from the government that it is so inefficient and it can't uh, do its it job properly because it actually kills those people who are, were supposed to be alive. Uh, moving back to the opposition, let's go. Mr. Speaker, what the proposition has been telling us is that they believe in the principle of retribution, but they do not believe that capital punishment is proportional to the amount of damage done by the criminal which has been convicted by a court in a fair trial. Uh, what we believe is that, A, the extreme cases they are talking about when someone has been wrongfully convicted are matters of problems of the system, not of the punishment. And uh, we also believe that there is a proportionality to the capital punishment simply because when someone kills 10 people or rapes 5 people or tortures someone or kidnaps someone, this is the harshest punishment you can give out. I'm not saying you should give it out for thieves or, I know, or for someone maybe you know, evading taxes, but there are crimes which require this punishment and I believe that capital punishment teaches people the rules of the game of life, that you can't break out of the, the system and do as you please because if you do, you will be punished because I do not believe and this table does not believe that uh, life imprisonment is uh, as, in, enough of an incentive for people to stop uh, breaking the same rules by which we all should play and by teaching people at a very early age that we can uh, play the game of life by, but play it by the rules accepted by all I believe that we will lower the crime rates and I, will, I believe that pri uh, capital punishment will have effect as a learning tool Thank you, Thank you. And now to finish off the opposition side, the government side Okay, I'm going to finish the government side by reviewing what uh, the previous speaker said He said something about the retribution and how the society is not making proportional measures but what we are on the government side about to say is that the, gov that the government should not make proportional measures and the government should never do calculus when deciding whether, he should, or whether it should kill somebody. And what we, we, are, we have argued throughout uh, every speaker, every previous speaker, is that the government should not kill anybody because it does not teach us the rule of life and how we should uh, behave, but it teaches all of the people that a man cannot change and that we cannot have hope that at a certain point some, person, some people cannot change and that we cannot not any longer believe in the people and that is what the government teaches us and in my case uh, I will just analyze the purpose of the criminal justice system because it has three major purposes first of all it is the criminal deterrence effect and the fear factor the fear factor then it's the retribution and the resocialization with the system without the, the death penalty we have the criminal deterrence effect because the society is either making life imprisonment and we also have a retribution here but we have our normal humane treatment of our prisoners and they should get our humane treatment because for example the government uh, even though we're living in a democracy the government is a sort of a moral propagator and it is teaching us our moral values and if it teaches us, for example, that we're living in a democracy and that we should respect each other, then we respect each other. And if it teaches us that, we, that it can kill somebody, then some other people may take the justice system in their own, own, own hands and say that killing somebody is... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That finished the government side. Last speaker with the opposition. <coughs> Ready? Okay. Yeah. Hello. I'm Lisa. Well, uh, the whole thing, the proposition side, which came out in many speeches, were democratic values. But I don't still quite understand yet, and they haven't proved how is uh, capital punishment not democratic when people and the government chosen by people uh, uh, well choose to do it. Well, about the, um, um, the last speaker um, that says that uh, it uh, could say that uh, we give people the message that a man can change. Uh, well, I believe it's quite true as uh, most of the people that go to, go to the prison and when they get out, they, you know, choose to commit another crime. So when a man goes to prison, this prison at the moment does, uh, uh, well, uh, not really have bill checking. And as the last speaker here said, uh, oh, well, I don't remember what he said. <laughs> and uh, but it's a problem of the system, uh, not the punishment, you know. Okay, um, well, uh, just to please the judge and, well, and make a new argument, which I don't know, we don't have many left, I say, that uh, this are, my argument would be the reunion of the church and uh, the government as, well, most people in the world are, are still religious and, well, 
in most of the religions, there is hell for people that commit crimes. So we send those people to hell. So the church will be pleased with government. We will, the world will be more tolerant. People will respect each other. Uh, and there will be no, you know, hate between oh religion. There will be no hate between government. You know, Muslims will be happy with Christians. Christians will be happy with atheists, and so on. So that's why capital punishment would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, guys. Uh, uh, I think you did a great job. I think that we had got arguments going back to the last table. And you see, actually, this is what happens. You weren't talking about repetition. You were giving new arguments. You were discussing new things. You moved along as the other team were giving their own new arguments. And that uh, how big we should feel more. You know, uh, you remember Karl Popper. You know how it feels a little bit different. You are repeating certain stuff. You're always... You all have the same story to tell, and you're just finding the ways how to make it stronger. But this is different. You see, you have to play play along. Now, you all had new arguments. Some of them were good. Some of them were not. Some of them were probably good. What would be better if you were given more than half a minute to talk about them? But it, well, the important thing is you have to realize that there will always be something new to tell, something new to realize, something new way to rebuttal. So, for example, there was no rebuttal on the economic. On the economical argument saying it's too expensive that we have to pay for them and that we just want to kill them and it would be cheaper for us. We, you can give a couple of rebuttals on that. Like, we don't care when it comes to life, money is really not an issue, so you know, maybe, but it, that's not that important. But the funny thing is actually that people on a death sentence yeah, actually cost more, more yeah, because of all the trials. All the trials and the appeals, which yeah. is much more than food that you give to a man who's in a sentence for life. But um, <clears throat> this is good. This is good to the end. And this is what we have to practice here today, and even practice here at the debates. Uh, uh, you, you can never find yourself to be in a situation where you don't know what to say, or you didn't hear the speaker before you're giving a new argument and you didn't rebuttal. There will be a lot of ways, you, you will, there will be a lot of times when you will be coming to the judges, or there will be some other debate team coming to the judges and telling them, but how do they want? And then just will be, well, they had a good argument. What? They had no arguments. But they, they had an argument. They maybe weren't good speakers. Maybe they didn't present those arguments best. But they mentioned them. And if you missed those arguments, you didn't do half of your job. So except for the prime minister, everybody else has to know, has to have this feeling. Seven speakers before you, seven new things, you rebuttal the, the argument before you. Keep in your mind the other six, but you rebuttal the one before you, because that's the one you have to listen. Because the guy who speaks before you is probably the person who will be the hardest to listen to, because you're writing down, you're preparing for your speech in three minutes, and here he comes with all these new arguments. Now I have to think about them too, so it's not easy, but good. And plus I add a little bit of a vibe about how good are you at debating, and you are. Everybody gets it, obviously. Everybody knows what I have to do. That's good, that's good. It's like the first exercise. Just move it to, to keep you keep you thinking. Oh, wait a second, I have to see what's happening. Uh,
Great. Okay, so this is essentially what generally occurs, right? A motion announced, team thinks of an argument, uh, run, uh, thinks of arguments, they run the arguments and they're told, look, you made a very strong argument, but uh, another team better fulfilled their burdens, right? It's essentially saying another team were more relevant to this debate. We don't want that to happen to you guys, right? It shouldn't happen. Like, debate is not necessarily about making the best arguments. It's about making very, very good arguments, which are relevant, right? And making it seem relevant. Then you win the debate, and that's how you should build your case, right? So, all the time, um, the first thing you should do when a motion is announced, so, you know, motion is announced, they've got 15 minutes, uh, and you'll usually silent prep, or however way you guys prep at the moment. First thing you should do is, what is this debate about, right? Always. What are the burdens in this debate? What do we need to prove in order to win this debate? Write them down. Write them down at the top of your page, write them very clearly at the top of your page. There is usually about two or three burdens in each debate. You can break those two or three burdens into like five sub-burdens, uh, but like the main burdens are the ones which you know, are obviously pivotal. Once you've done that, the rest is somewhat implicit. Right? Then what we want you to do is, once you've identified those are burdens, is think up arguments which fit those burdens. Right? This will make a whole lot more sense in a second. Um, don't worry about... Sorry? Yeah, exactly. Uh, don't worry about writing this down, I'm more than happy to uh, send it to you. Um, although, like, if you need it for tomorrow, then you know, we can talk about that, right? So, just to, before I go run you through an example so that we illustrate what we're talking about, uh, a couple of important considerations, right? On opposition, you don't necessarily have to, like, fulfill all of the burdens, right? You can show one burden, like, you can prove one burden excellently and win the debate, right? So, for example, if uh, we just run around this house, uh, would bring back capital punishment. Uh, proposition have to show a couple of things, right? First and foremost, they have to show it's legitimate for the state to kill someone. They also have to show that this will actually lead to good things, right? Those are two like broad burdens in that debate. Opposition can concede it's not necessarily the best idea to do so, but they can concede that this could lead to a better deterrent, right? But if they show you that it's just immoral, it's just illegitimate, illegitimate to do so, they will still win. Right? In the same way that if you had a motion, it would be a stupid, stupid motion, but if you had a motion of information flight, it has been found that if you torture children, um, like, like in their pain, you can get a cure for cancer, right? And the motion is this house will torture, uh, torture children. Opposition can get up and go, yes, we would have a cure for cancer, but it's not worth it because it's just immoral to do this, right? And they can still win the debate by doing that. <coughs> However, the proposition, like, have to generally fulfill all of their burdens to some degree. And in opposition, you still want to fulfill your burdens, because if another team does very well on one or two burdens, then they're still going to beat you, right? But just bear that in mind uh, for, uh, for strategy. Right, cool. So let's go into one, right? So, motion. This house would require all the schools to teach safe sex to children from age 10, regardless of parental consent. Um, any questions on the motion? No, ace. Okay, hands up. What kind of things do you think the government has to prove in this debate? Go for it. That the, that, that at the moment parents do not teach their children uh, how safe sex is done properly? Um, not necessarily, but I'll explain why in a minute. Yeah. This is legitimate that the government can do that without a parental consent? Brilliant. But is it important that the children Brilliant. are taught? Brilliant. Is it legitimate to do it at the age of 10? Perfect. Right? That was essentially the three of what you said, um, just in different order, right? Um, so before I go into R, let's have a look at why this is the case, and let's have a look at why what you said, which is very important, is not necessarily fundamental, right? Um, first thing, like, all of this is regardless, is, is irrelevant if children at the age of 10, like, aren't old enough to understand, right? So this isn't necessarily a particularly hard burden to fulfill, but you still need to do it. Because opposition, if they're cheeky, can get up and go, we're happy with this model, we just think it should be done at 16, right? You need to explain why at 10, okay? Excellent. Secondly, so that's your first burden, because obviously without that, the debate doesn't happen, yeah? Second one, okay, given, so obviously you've proved it at this point, given that children are old enough to understand and know about it at 10, it's probably important to explain that they should know about it, right? Like, I can probably understand quantum physics, if taught to me, but it's probably not that important that I understand, right? But why is it, like, it's really important, it's pivotal. So you can tell that the first and second burden in this debate 
I'll go up like this, right? They're hand in hand. You would often cover that within one point. But it's important to know they're distinct, because in some debates you don't need to do both, right? So does that make sense? You have to show it's necessary. So now, if you've got to the point at which it's necessary, you're doing excellently on proposition, right? Because the third bit somewhat follows. This is, I'm going to link this back now, right? But the reason that it's important that the state has the authority um, is because, like, opposition can argue, look, we accept they're old enough, we accept they need to know. However, what is more important is parental control of their children, and it's illegitimate for a state to overrule them. Do you see how the op can still win, right? Um, so what you need to do, firstly and foremost, is show that the state has the authority. Within that, you can talk exactly about what you said, right? But do you see how that's an argument which proves this? Yeah. So you say, look, given it's important and they need to know and they like, are able to know, lots of parents don't teach it well, which means that when parents don't do something well, we say that that like, responsibility transfers over to the state, because the state has a duty to that child, and the state has like, an incentive for that child to be raised correctly, because otherwise it has to pick up the slack, otherwise that child's not going to be like, a good human being, which is bad for society. But do you see how like, it's not necessarily a burden, it's an argument which fulfills the burden. Yeah? Does that make sense for everyone? Right? So very quickly, let's rattle through opposition. I'll, I'll give you a clue. It's like vague, vaguely similar to proposition. <laughs> yep, let's go through. Come on. Just shout them out. Yeah. It's not necessary. Yeah. Very same position. Freedom. Okay. Individual freedom and freedom and So that will come under the third burden, right? That's excellent. So now, before we move on, just draw a distinction, right? Because there's been a little bit of confusion between burdens and arguments, right? So what burdens are? Are they like I like to say they're like broad things, right? So broad things, which are like you know things you need to prove. Sometimes they are an argument. But more of what usually what happens is there are arguments which fulfill those burdens, right? So if we go back to the third one, uh, parents have the authority to decide blah, 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 right? What we've heard from here and here are both arguments to prove that, right? So on one hand, you say parents already do a very good job of this. This is an unnecessary policy, and it's going to piss them off, like, disproportionately. Then you can say this really undermines religious freedoms, which we think are really important, large sectors of society, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, the state doesn't have the authority. Do you see how these are arguments which fulfill a burden, rather than burdens themselves? Yep? Ace, right? So let's get used to this. Let's do another one, right? So corporal punishment is not capital punishment, right? Uh, corporal punishment is hitting children at schools, uh, not killing them. That would be bad. Um, right? So this house uh, would bring back corporal punishment. So government, like, hands up again. What kind of burdens do we think we need to prove? Discipline. Sorry? It's a good tool of discipline. Okay, I can tell you that a good tool of discipline is punching a kid in the face. Um, or killing them. Pun? Someone said something? The government can make the authority That's a moral, uh, moral way of punishing. Right, first and foremost, so it's legitimate to hit children, right? You have to prove that first. Because, you know, like I said, otherwise you can go, well, it's probably, like, genuinely, like, killing, like, Say you guys are like, we're the teachers, right? And you're looking, yeah, I could, if one of you misbehaved, I could kill you, right? The rest of you would probably behave. Probably not fair. Right? So you have to show, first and foremost, legitimacy. I know some of this sounds obvious, but trust me, like, we've judged like, hundreds of debate rounds. And people skip them. Yeah, and then you lose. Right? It's just such an easy victory proposition. Um, so yeah, it's legitimate to hit children. Excellent. Second. Is necessary that, that there are now Cool, cool, we'll get, excellent, all right, we'll get to that in a second. There's one which is a little bit trickier in this debate, right? Where is corporal punishment? Is that at home? It is legitimate to hit children at school. Excellent, it's legitimate for teachers or like someone to hit them at school, right? Brilliant. Um, actually, like this is incorrect, because if you make, if, I think if you make this properly, you shouldn't have teachers hitting the children. Uh, the best map I've seen is if the, the, the child gets sent to a room where like the nurse or a professional uh, who has been trained in hitting them. Seriously, this is the kind of thing you have. Um, because if you don't, uh, the reason, I know this sounds silly, but this is an important case development actually, is what you do on proposition is you think, how can we have a fair debate, but a debate we are very likely to win? Right? So essentially, how do we somewhat cheat, but not cheat? 
Okay? So how do we get the closest to cheating? So if I said in proposition, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have corporal punishment. So what happens if the child misbehaves, a teacher can hit that child. So say someone misbehaved in this class, I would hit them, right? One of the main opposition arguments is then teachers are human. They've been pissed off by this child. They have a massive incentive to accidentally or purposefully hit this child too hard. Or they just don't like this child, so they get joy of beating them, right? That's actually a very strong opposition argument. It all, yeah, exactly. They don't hit them. So you have, a, you, have, you have a rule that's applied in school, but it's not really being applied because some of the teachers don't want to beat up kids. All the kids are really terrible. Exactly, right? Or, like, it's done by the teacher, and that screws over the dynamic in the class because, like, you know, uh, the teacher's done it. Also, another argument you make in opposition is that child who's got hit by that teacher has been hit in front of everyone else, right? Everyone's going to be making fun of that child, bullying, etc. Et Do you see how that opens up miles and miles of argument? However, if you change that mechanism to we're going to send that child to a different room, they'll be checked, they'll be hit by someone, but a nurse will be present, we can make sure that the no marks are left from the child and that no one witnesses it bar the nurse and the thing. Do you see how it's still a debate, right? You're still saying corporal punishment. You haven't squirreled the motion, you haven't popped something out, you've just been very clever, right? That's what you should do. So that's why that one's important. Excellent. Okay, wow. So we had uh, correctly uh, from here that, like, Essentially, it's necessary, right? Like, yeah. you need to show that it leads to some, like, large improvement because, like, a minor improvement could probably be achieved by something else. So within this, you need to show why it can't be achieved in other ways, right? So I'm going to skip over the op ones because they're not going to surprise any of you. Um, sorry. Yeah? Ta-da! Unsurprising. Um, brilliant. So I think there should be one more. This is actually quite a tough motion. I think it's a bad motion, but it's a good one to think of like uh, <coughs> So let's go again. Burdens. Yeah. But it's the government's task to pay services. Uh, so all those okay. So yeah. So a mixture of you two, right? So it's bad to smoke, and government has a responsibility. Uh, you know, essentially, right? So you have to show that has a large negative impact on a large society. Because I mean, something could be bad for me. But that probably doesn't mean that they should get involved. Right, uh, this is excellent. Anything else? Yeah, but just about it. With the work for uh, people to quit smoking. Sorry, maybe you repeat that. Break down, they will. Right, exactly. Yeah, you'd obviously have to show that this would lead to a change. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, we should prove that the government has to uh, have an incentive or a benefit to spend other budget monies in order to prove how smoking is so yeah. bad. So yeah. Spending money on getting them to quit is more beneficial than spending money for cancer treatment. Excellent, right? So, like, I mean, cost, like I, I was telling the guys out there, cost is rarely a good argument in debate. Because what you just say on proper op is, look, even if it costs a lot of money, if it's a good thing to do, we're happy to pay it. There are no budgets in BP, right? Um, however, if you say, if you can show, in this debate, actually, because it says the word pay, like, money does, is actually quite important. Excellent, right? Anything else? Let's see if we covered all of them. <coughs> right? So, the legitimate one in this is, is actually quite important, but not for the reason it is in the other one. So in the other one is, is it fair to the child, essentially, to hit the child? I don't think the smoker is going to complain that you're paying the money, but I think the non-smokers will complain, right? So you need to show, this is the one that you guys missed, that it's legitimate. Because you can lose this debate by proving one in three excellently, but someone gets up and look, I'm a non-smoker, I'd be really pissed off if we were paying smokers to quit, right? However, like, you can kind of get around that by showing you get rid of a, like, a, large, a large problem, right? So that's essentially it on burdens, right? It's really something quite simple that people forget. Like, like I forget in rounds, like I've forgotten in really important rounds, and then have received the feedback I showed you at the start. It's the most frustrating thing to give a speech and then realize you could have given a more relevant speech, right? This is not the quality of your speech in isolation. It's about how it fits in that debate. Is there any questions on burdens? No. It's really good to remember this, because this is one of, the most, one of those fundamental things that people skip. There are certain motions that will be given, international politics motions. So a lot of people skip burdens, thinking like, well, it's not my job the legitimacy of the UN or the legitimacy of the international. Yeah, it's not, but if you don't have that step, everything seems weaker. So this steps, this burden parts are really, really important. So keep that always in your mind. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah. Or do you want to cover? Do you want to cover different roles? Yeah. So, yeah, we're ahead of schedule. We're ahead of time. Yeah. Please. So the different roles in the government. Uh, uh, ignore this. Actually, this is not needed. So I not like yeah. Uh, so okay, different roles, different roles. You know, four roles. There are main four roles, right? Everybody knows that. Uh, uh, speaker roles. You know, speaker roles as well. We have to go through them again. Okay. Prime minister. Everybody knows what the prime minister does. Is your typical prime minister gets up and explains how the things are going to be done. He gives you the plan. If there is, if there should be, of course, plan. There should be a plan. That's okay. But if there should be a plan, prime minister is the one who should be doing it. Nobody else. Well, there are certain cases where you have a counter plan by the opposition. But that's very rare. Uh, but in that case, then it means that the leader of the opposition is acting just like the prime minister, meaning that all the specific parts, yeah, like mechanism, criteria, and definitions, should come in the first speech. In the first speech. If your second speaker is now getting up and trying to redefine something, or better, trying to explain the mechanism, that means that the prime minister has not his job done. So, Prime Minister shouldn't be a person explaining, giving you the arguments and, and making you believe that this part of the story is true. He should be the one actually explaining how this debate will look. I know it seems a lot of times like it's something that will not give you a certain edge, but on the other hand, good Prime Ministers are incredibly important. Good, good Prime Minister job when it's done good, it gives very, very big benefits to that side of the bench and his team. Because a lot of times the debates are being lost by the team who is being attacked and destroyed by the other side, explaining how we have logical problems that we don't have follow-ups, that we have mechanism, but mechanism has nothing to do with reality or some of the arguments have nothing to do with the definition that was given to us. All those simple things can make a judge seem, uh, think, look at the government and think, it's like, oh my God, yeah, they can do a good job. So prime minister is incredibly important. And of course, two of the most important arguments uh, has to be mentioned, meaning that, yes, the Prime Minister has to stand up and say, and this is the reason we're doing this, these are the values we're doing this as well, and I will also explain to you in what direction this debate will go. And it's basically, I, I can't say that it's a role that should be given to a better speaker or a worse speaker, or a person who has more uh, more, more control over his uh, flow sheet, or just uh, a better, a better, I don't know, a better, a better uh, orator. I'm not so certain. I think it's one of those things that maybe you would prefer a person who's more familiar with the subject being talked about in the team to go first in the case of being a prime minister. It's not just a feeling that you get from somebody who, who talks about something he knows, but I think it's you need to concentrate because you need to do all of those things. Like there, it's necessity. You have to do it. So that's prime minister, right? Uh, <clears throat> deputy prime minister. So then that's the leader of the Yeah, okay. Uh, so, we all know. So, the uh, leader of the opposition stand up, stands up, he rebuts the, the Prime Minister, of course, he finds uh, all the weak links. So just before, uh, the, 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 before directly responding to the arguments or setting up theme line principles, there's another fact. Ask yourself always very simple questions when the government stands up. So leader of opposition should be the one standing up and saying, listen, but you did a square. Or listen, you're not talking truth, facts, you, you're giving us false facts. Or listen, the cause of your problem is not being solved by your solution. So there's a lot of things that you can do just before attacking the argumentation, where you can see the government having a really big problem. They're either not logical, they're lying to you, they're committing squirrel, or just the arguments they've given are completely not connected with the logic of what is causing, what is the problem, how we're going to solve the problem. So, We'll look at that just before you attack arguments. If you feel something is fishy in the government, if you feel something is off, there is no logic in their speech, ask yourself why before you look at the arguments. So if they have problems with burdens, you mention burdens. If they have no burdens or whatever, you have to mention all those things. Of course, later you, you lead on with the uh, Respond directly to the Prime Minister's arguments. And yeah, three arguments, uh, it's, it's not Karl Popper, it's not like the first one of the opposition, so it's not about him standing up giving uh, one argument and saying the other arguments will come later. No, uh, yes, of course the second speaker will have their, his own new uh, matter that he has to bring in or an extra argument, but the leader of the opposition should also be a man who gives us and explains to us what will be the arguments that the first opposition will give, because it's fair. 
because BP is one also by that you're playing it fair. So it's not about uh, trying to escape from the rebuttal from the other team, no, it's considered actually to be stronger. So when the leader of opposition stands up and says, these are our three arguments, so the second speaker of the government will have a chance of understanding what they have to rebuttal in advance. It's considered to be fair, it's considered to be showing the strength of your motion, it's considered something that is definitely a necessity for the leader of the opposition. And then we have the deputy leader of the government. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Deputy, deputy Prime Minister. Every Prime Minister, of course, uh, has to respond to the opposition's arguments, everybody knows that, uh, uh, has to figure out, of course, what is the most harmful argument, is there some sort of uh, uh, attack on the opposition side that tries to deal with things that we mentioned earlier, like squirrels or mechanisms, lack of definitions. It's not a good thing, but he has to deal with those things. You don't want to judge after the second speaker uh, of the first government that still don't um, still not understanding what you're trying to say. That's like that's game over. I mean, it's a bad thing that you have to cop out, but nonetheless, you have to do it. You have to recognize it immediately, and of course, afterwards you grow on <coughs> uh, defending your own arguments. Uh, and uh, well, one key new argument. Now, this is uh, this is very important. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister also has a role of giving you something. And in the majority of cases, it can either be something like stakeholder analysis or giving you an, an example. You know, like examples in Karl Popper here, it's not, you cannot just give you an example. You cannot go, well, but in Brazil, the banana industry is going well. You know, that's not really, you have to give him a, a further argument, a better explanation, a deeper analysis of maybe something that was already mentioned before. But your job is basically to just follow, follow the leader and understand it's, you're like a bodyguard. You're like a second speaker and all the knives that are going at the prime minister, you're trying to catch them, trying to jump, and you're trying to fire back at the same time. It's a little bit of a <laughs> job. It's a really hard job because it's one of those jobs that you know you break or you win because it's, uh, it's it, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do in those seven minutes. Um, shall we go on? Yeah. Uh, one more to me? No, no, I think you got back on. Okay. Uh, deputy Leader of the Opposition, almost almost kind of the same job, uh, but much more new arguments. You as an opposition have now, until now you have time. If you're the fourth speaker, that means that have already been 21 minutes before you. That means that you had enough time to not just uh, think of the arguments that you came up before, but you also to realize what is developing in the way. And, and basically, this, this is the last speaker of the first part of the table. So, uh, in a way, it's not your job to actually make some form of a some form of a whip speech, but it would be nice if you're trying to find any reasons where you can point out how a certain part of the bay finishes now and uh, we will give, us, we'll give, for example, some new argument that, of course, the second part will have to deal with, but it will be something new, something that was not mentioned before or specifically attacked before, something to give you an extra edge so the second part will have to talk about you, and it's always a good plus for the opposite, first opposition that uh, when the second government is completely gets caught into rebuttaling their arguments, and the second speaker of the opposition is very good at it because if you give a really good new argument in, like, your, in, in your speech, when the, the, there's a chance the whole second part will be about you and that's something you want to take care of. Uh, member of the government, extension speaker. Now, I know I don't know if a lot of you didn't have that in high school debates, and a lot of people really hate that in British parliamentary. They always say, oh, the extension, oh, the second government. Actually, for me, personally, second government is probably my favorite position. I really like extension speeches. I, uh, the reason is this. Uh, imagine yourself to be a coalition partner of the prime minister. So what is your role? Your role is basically to stay in power. What well, the motion is given on the floor, it's you want it to pass. There are certain values that you believe of the first government, of course, and some logical directions you will follow. But you really are not obliged in any form of way to completely follow the prime minister. Now, that gives you a whole lot of variety of things that you can do. You can either find completely new arguments, new, new ways of arguing and stuff. For example, let's say, um, this house would, uh, this house would uh, allow Japan to become a permanent member of UN Security Council. Right. It's a huge motion, there's a lot of stuff you can do. And let's say that the first part of the table is only talking about international security and how Japan is a really great country and how we need more 
countries from different regions being involved. Right. But now you're a second, second government, and what can you do? Mm -hmm. You can do something completely different. You can, for example, mention the Japan because it gives its number one money contributor to the UN. You can develop a whole new organization line saying, we need more people to get, I don't know, involved with the UN. And those who are most involved, of course, will be benefiting from getting a really good position, some functions, because they've given so much. So you're not talking about international peace at all, but you're completely following the logic of the first part. And that's where actually the member of the government has a big job. I mean, you as a team have a big job. But he's the one who has to go out and, of course, rebound the first opposition, some of the things that the state of this would definitely for opposition. Make two or three more arguments, far more deeply on the original, like on the opening government arguments. But the thing is, you can really, you have to distinguish yourself from the rest of the world. It's, it's specifically standing up and saying, this now starts a new era. This is the reason why we are not the first government, we're the second government. And this is not the reason why we've given, we've been given 28 minutes already to listen to the debate on this motion. And we will give you something new and something, something you will enjoy. And so you have to work, think of that uh, when you're second uh, government, not just another government speaker, another government team giving you arguments, but try to find something that, like, when you give, to the, when you give it to the debate, everybody's like, oh, this is something new. And that's a great thing. That's actually one of the biggest things you have to do. Uh, uh, member of the, op of the opposition, almost, almost the same thing, but on the other side, but with a little bit of an easier job because uh, now you're building it up. Now you're building it up. You have so much, so many stuff that the government said that you have to rebuttal, so many things you can go after, and now you have a third government speaker who gives you an extension, and new arguments you have to be concentrated on that, because you can't forget that. There's a lot of people, I know, a lot of uh, 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 starting debaters, when they're closing oppositions, everybody likes to be that. They just go out and they like spend all seven minutes destroying the first opposition. All the stuff that the first opposition didn't say, they're, they're destroying the first government. They're destroying the first government, completely destroying the first government, not rebuttaling the second government. Basically doing a very bad job in that. Because if the second government is doing their job, giving you a good extension, it is, your, it is probably the biggest thing that you have to do when it comes to rebuttal. Uh, and plus, you have new arguments. Uh, that you have to give. You can always find new arguments, but if you have good rebuttals from those rebuttals, good, good arguments can come, specifically when we're talking about the second part of the paper. But it's something that you will in other workshops also work on, but you have to remember that. Second opposition, never ever forget the second government. Don't do that. Don't get all hyped and, like, I figured it out to destroy the government's case. Yes, but the second, the second government will have something new, always take concentrate and bit something. And now the whips, basically, uh, you want to explain the whips? So we'll just yeah, yeah, show sure. this. Yes, sure. Sure. so very specific. I've never been a good whip. I'm not yeah, so, um, summary speeches are very, like, to be honest, to begin with, are very confusing, right? Um, they are, all the other speeches, essentially, are very similar, right? You do a bit of rebuttal, you take the debate in a new direction. Um, government whip and opposition whip, you need to do a more wholesome speech, right? So essentially you have a couple of things you need to do. First and foremost, in this position, you have to reply to the opposition extension for the exact same reasons that Bono correctly pointed out for why the opposition extension has to respond to the government extension, right? Quite simply, if you don't respond, who's going to respond, right? No one's talking after you. It's that simple, right? Have to do that. But the rest of your speech, right, is rather than saying I have three points for you, is usually down on clash points, right? So this is actually not that dissimilar from a summary speech in, uh, in KP, right? So you try and bring it into areas of clash. So for example, um, if you had, like, so the, take this Japan motion, uh, one of your, your first clash point is probably going to be like, why, um, like, uh, why Japan in particular, oh, sorry, that's a bad clash point, um, like, why the UN needs like uh, another member, maybe a first clash point. Secondly, why Japan is the best member, right? Something along that. Obviously, it depends on what debate you've had. Uh, but it's what were the key issues in debate, and how can you put that under a heading again, right? Um, and then what you do within that is the, is the complex bit, right? What you do within that is juggle quite a few things, right? What you want to do, first and foremost, is destroy the other side, right? All of their arguments, at some point, you have to take down. Uh, or at least attempt to take down. They may look like, let's be honest, right? there will be some arguments where you're like, eh, 
not really sure what to say. In KP, what you do is you ignore it and hope the judge doesn't notice. In BP, you can't do that, right? You have to have a go at it or make it seem irrelevant or say, look, even if they're right, right? even if they're right, um, this is less important than what we've told you for this reason, right? Um, but what you want to do is not just knock their arguments out in isolation to your extension. Is uh, The way I describe it a lot of the time, especially to begin with, is imagine your extension is a weapon, right? Use it to knock down everyone else's arguments. So an extension, uh, sorry, a summary speech may go something like this. So my first clash point is why this is legitimate, your opposing government. So you say, opening government correctly point out that we have a problem, right? Opening opposition get up and they try and explain to us that like this is illegitimate, because apparently it's wrong to hit children because like you know this like puts, like it makes them scared, right? What what my partner says, they say Bonner's my extension. What Bonner firstly tells you, right, is actually we're quite happy for them to be scared. Because if they're scared, it means that they are going to like not do this again. That reaches like a fundamental value of our case, right? We're happy for that. Secondly, what we tell you is actually like that's that individual being scared is trade off is traded off against the other members of the class who are probably less scared because like this kid isn't being such a such an annoying person anymore, right? Um, because they're no longer going to do those things. So what we say is we're willing to like, even if we didn't have the first benefit we told you, we also told you this idea of we're willing to trade off this one punishment to prevent other kids from feeling what opposition say is a bad thing, right? This is something else we bring you in extension. So do you know it's this idea of essentially responding to their arguments with your material, right? So often like you get in closing teams as the extension speaker gets up and just says the extension, right? This is our extension, but doesn't have the time to in detail, like specifically targeted. That's not their job. In summary, it is your job. So you say, look, when we said this, this is directly responding to this argument. This is why it beats this, right? Um, so what you do there, so if you notice, is in that like little extract, I somewhat summarize open government, but like implicitly make them look a bit stupid, right? They're like, yeah, they kind of give you this vague thing. But look what we did. Look what my partner <coughs> did, right? He really wins this point. So that's what you want to do. You want to show that you want to stand behind open government, but what you want to show in particular is that your partner is the one who's won the debate and why, right? So that's how that very, uh, that's how that's done. And it's the same thing on closing opposition. Um, as you get more experience, and to be, even to begin with, under not every point you have to say opening government said something on this, right? Like they probably didn't. Even if they did and it wasn't that important, just ignore it, right? Um, but you have to mention them. I would say at least twice in your summary, like the opening to you, just say, you know, like, give them a fledgling mention, you know, like, they were in this debate, they said things, but we won this debate, right, uh, just obviously not that explicit, it makes you look like a douchebag, uh, but that's actually it, like, are there any questions on, on whip speeches, like, like it, to be honest, it's something that you would just get in practice, like, there are lots of different ways, like, I have, like, broadly, like, seven different summary techniques, depending on the round, like, you know, you just develop new ones and you go along. But that essentially... It, it, it takes experience it's not easy to do. Uh, some of the really good speeches that are very good speeches reminds, remind you of uh, judges' ju adjudication feedback that you get. Like all of some of the uh, great speeches that I've heard that have an awesome summary were really people explaining what, what happened in the debate, like they were objective. It was really tricky because it's really seen, but they were not going out and standing we won this debate, we didn't, but they were really like judging, well, the first government came out with this and this argument, and the second opposition came and covered those arguments. They sat down and you had a feeling like, is this guy a judge? What was he doing it now? So there's different ways of how you can do those things, but uh, Tim said it's very important. You have to definitely uh, mention, mention what your team did. So you have to mention, connect all the dots when it comes to your extensions in the second part and mentions the first part of the team as well. Well, the first part of the table at some point. But unfortunately, when it comes to whip, whip speeches, it is experience because it really is 90% of what happened in the debate. But you have to train. Uh, anyways, what we have now on the... Yeah, so now we're going to go into this. Uh, different roles we can cover within the right time and roles. Uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah, how much uh, We've done an hour and ten. We're going to have to... So the training is first, but we're going to... Yeah. Okay, cool. Alright, so what we're going to talk to you about now 
is prep time, right? So this is one of the most important distinctions from BP to any format, right? We sadly gone to the days of 50 minutes prep time with your coach and your two teammates. Or two months. Or two months, right? <laughs> Those days are over. You have 50 minutes, okay? Um, so this is, I'm gonna try and, what we're gonna try and do in this exercise is more how to use prep time, how to generate arguments, and how you should use those arguments to develop a case, right? They're all very, like, like they're linked. It's a nice Venn diagram, if you will, right? A couple of things before we begin, which is very, really obvious, so I'm gonna run through it very quickly. Work as a team, right? It's not a question of who's gonna get the best speaker points, I'm gonna hold material. We don't do that. If we see you doing that, we will throw things. Yeah, and right. by the way, uh, speaker points here are very different than in high school. They're, you cannot, you cannot go out and lose the debates and win 28 points in every round and hope to be the fifth speaker of Because that will never happen. If you lose, if you're fourth place, you will get fourth place individual speaking points. So it is really all about the team at all points. You don't want to, exactly, exactly what I'm saying, you don't want to hog good arguments or good question. You know how you have a, a good question that you want to ask and you're waiting for a, for a cross in, the high, in high school? Here, no, here you have points. If you have a good point, that is the same point that you and your partner need to ask. So you really start having, you have to start getting in teams. So anything that you have a great idea, specifically if you think it's a great idea, it has to be written down, your partner has to see it. It's, and if he says, I'm not sure, you will not think in your head like, okay, okay whatever, I'll do it on my own. Because it never works, so, yeah. There you go, exactly, right? And this leads nicely onto this idea, idea uh, too, right? Constantly ask yourself why. So in prep time, like, you're friends, right? But don't be like super, super friendly in prep time. If someone says an argument, don't be like, oh yeah, it's brilliant, it's brilliant, yeah? Like, no, <laughs> question it on it, right? Because if you don't question on it, if we're in opposition, we're gonna do it, right? And we're gonna make it look silly. So don't let that happen. Right, like flesh it out in prep, right? Constantly ask each other why. So when we say constantly ask each other why, this is this is the reason, okay? For example, outside we had an argument which was like, so this is gonna be a deterrent, okay? Say Warren and I are prepping, I'm like, I've got a really good argument, right? This is gonna be a good deterrent. If he says, Yeah, excellent, right, you made that argument. If I get up and go, this is gonna be a really good deterrent. That's why, right? It's gonna they're gonna be like, it's not gonna be a good deterrent, boom, argument's gone, right? What you wanna do is Push each other, why, blah, blah, blah. Then you'll get to a point where you're like, oh, I'm not actually sure why actually this is really going to scare someone. Then you need to think about that, because it's really important, right? Plus, but you can have an argument that only one person understands and the other doesn't. Exactly. You know, if you give an answer to why and the other guy is still like, I don't get it. Is you're it doing it wrongly or it, still, or it doesn't make well, sense. What's a bad argument? Exactly. And the reason this is so important is uh, what Bonner told you in like, the last 20 minutes. Is you're working as a team, like the second speaker has to defend the first part of this material. I've been in numerous debates where I've not really understood what my partner said. So then when I had to get up to defend it, I'm like, I don't really care. Like, screw that. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. Unsurprisingly, we take a third or fourth, right? But you really need to know what the argument is in order to be able to understand and defend it, right? Write your analysis down. So this is something I do awful lot, but I think is really important. If you, for example, worked out a really key line of analysis, especially if you're closing, write it down, right? Write the argument down, because you're gonna to have to write it down at some point. Why not do it whilst you're talking about it? Otherwise, it's a waste of time. And four, this is something which I hope you've been taught, but I'm gonna very quickly cover it now. BP is not a format of debate where this happens, right? Argument, rebuttal, right? So argument, and the only engagement you have is rebuttal, no. All of your arguments are comparative, right? In BP, the beautiful thing is you can sometimes acknowledge someone has made a good argument, right? You know, this is the way you like, even if they're true, right? Like, you know, you don't want to make it seem like they've made a good argument. That's a bad idea, right? Even if it is true, their argument is less important than our argument for this reason, right? This reason is sometimes a new argument, yeah, to justify why one is more important than the other. So always consider that. But sometimes in prep time, you will, like, say this debate, have the punishment, right? If your if your opposition, you may concede in prep, you may be like, look, this probably would be a very good deterrent, right? You know, like, if you start killing people for robbery, um, they're probably not going to steal anymore. So we may have to acknowledge that. But what we need to show is that this doesn't outweigh what we want to talk about. But that's an argument, isn't it? Like, to explain why one outweighs the other. So you need to consider that in prep time. Right, that, oh, and just one more thing. Yeah, uh, sure. The same thing with the arguments, the same goes for the motion. 
I'm not going, I'm not talking about the fact that you receive a motion and you don't know what it is because, I don't know, you don't understand one word or you just don't know what it is. No, I'm talking about when you hear the motion and both of you think that you understand the motion, but you're thinking about different things that has to be put out immediately. So, if you get a motion, sit down, ask your partner, what do you think this debate is about? Exit. That's a really good first question. What do you think this debate is about? And if you hear some crazy answer, well, then you have the first problem you have to solve. Yeah. What this debate is really about. And then you continue with everything. Because there's a lot of times when I've been debating, and of the half of the prep time, I realized that my partner doesn't think it's the same debate we're going to have. And that's a big problem. How can you make arguments if we're not debating the same thing? Uh, plus, also, you know, give yourself a minute to think only about the motion or half a minute. Only about the motion, not about the argument that you're going to start building, about uh, what position you are, and meaning that, oh, so this is the motion and I'm opposition. Okay, opposition cases. No, no. Think for a second about the motion. For example, uh, on Euros in Belgium, there was a motion talking about this house would give indigenous people oh, yeah. something cool. Yeah, give self-government to the indigenous people, meaning the Native Americans. Now, if you get that motion and you sit down and you start thinking about the opposition or the government, what case, what side you are, you're going to miss a lot of those things because it's an interesting motion, maybe not a good motion, but it's definitely something that you haven't debated yesterday or two weeks before. So give yourself a minute to you, to you and your partner to sit down and think about general emotion. Think about Native Americans. Think about self-government for a second, you know. <coughs> you put your mind uh, at ease when it comes to what the motion is about and ask your partner what the motion is about. When you agree what you're debating on, then you can normally start building your Yeah, I'm so glad everyone has pointed this out because actually I've left this out. It's definitely the most important question, right? There are two questions, right? The first one, trust me, you have to do this, is clarify what side of the debate you're on. So if the house, like lots of motions have the word not in them, right? I have gone into a room in opening opposition in my first year with the president of our society. I'm leader of all. I think we are saying that you shouldn't take this magical pill. Prime Minister gets up. After two minutes, I'm like, Gareth, he's saying what I'm meant to be saying. Then we reread the motion. It turns out it has not in it, right? We're on the wrong side. Gareth's like, yeah, just flip your argument. I had three minutes to try and change my whole speech from op, from prop to op, right? It's ridiculous. We wasted all of our prep time, essentially. You seem like an idiot, but do it. I'm top room at Cambridge, I'm walking my partner, I'm like, I'm sorry to do this again, but just to clarify, we are on this side of the motion, we are arguing this. He says yes. Second thing with bonuses, which is pivotal, is actually understand what you think the motion's about. Top room, sorry, second room at Cambridge IB, only two weeks ago, motion is, this house believes that China should prioritize uh, political reform over economic development. So we go in, we're opening government, my partner goes to me, he's broken at Europe, quite brilliant speaker, goes to me, all right, Steve, I'm not, I think this debate is about the Western countries imposing sanctions on China in order for them to do this, right? Uh, what do you think? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think that's what we do if you want to fourth the round, right? That's obviously not what the prop is. I'm like, the debate is about this is how we should prop it. We are China. We think it's probably a good thing to give people economic rights. Uh, surprise, surprise, we won, right? Like, it's a weak case in the sense of, like, you don't need to a great, like, the best debate. But the first motion that he thought this debate was about would be suicide, right? Like, getting up and going, oh, yeah, we're going to impose economic sanctions. That's not what the debate's about. That's a disproportionate burden of the proposition. So if you don't clarify that at the beginning in any of your positions, you're screwed, right? But the other reason it's important, especially in opposition, is if you know what you think the debate should be about, like this links back to what one was saying earlier, you can get up and go, look, this is what they've painted the debate to be about. They've said, for example, that in Rwanda everyone's living peacefully and that like, this is a policy which will help that. No, what is actually happening is this. Then you very clearly state where your case is and where the others are. Excellent, right? So actually that's the first two things you should do, right? So apologies for that. After that, however, so I'm going to do top half strategy, right? Case development, whatever you want to call it. Sorry, good luck on you. <coughs> right? First, say four minutes should be silent preparation, right? First of all, what you want to do is identify the burden. 
Once you have done within that, clarify with your partner that you're on the same lines, right? They may have worded a burden differently, like some of we, like some of us did earlier, but you know, broadly they should be the same thing, right? Once you've done that, continue again for a couple of minutes on silent arguments. The reason this is important is because if you start some, like, there's a case to say bottom half you can start talking straight away, but like, you know, this is especially for in beginner slash intermediate. I think this is a good way. Is you don't want your thinking to be influenced by what your partner said straight away, because otherwise you may miss out on thinking of an excellent idea because you start talking about something too early, right? So write down what the arguments you are, okay? Um, obviously write down your burdens, it already happens, right? Then what you do is you briefly like talk to each other what your arguments are. Then you determine what are the most important arguments to fulfill your burdens and in what order, right? So if you're opening government, if you remember earlier I pointed out uh, the one about children, um, that was pivotal, right? Like the fact that children are old enough to understand. You need to prove that first. It's no point proving that third, because if you're, if, if we're judging, we're like fine, we'll be like thank you for proving it, but we're a bit like, come on, like it's stupid to prove that third, um, because you may run out of time. It would seem like a format, like you were. You don't really know what you're doing. Yeah. If you yeah. wanted to add three arguments, so okay, let, let's make yeah. this a third argument. Exactly. Exactly. Especially in opening government, right? The best, like, what like, was it? Just expand on this as a DPM would do for PM, right? The best PM speeches are ones which just follow, right? If a PM sits down, sometimes the debates finish, right? Yeah. Same with leader of all, because it's just followed the structure of, okay, here is our first burden, here is an argument that, like, these are two arguments which justify that, two sub points or whatever, right? Here is a second burden, here are three reasons which we put that third argument, one reason, right? And you're like, yeah, I agree with you, that's a really good idea. Um, because, you know, if you think about it, that speech has done everything. Obviously, DPM gets up and expands and brings in more arguments, but the cases can be won from the first speech. Same in media or box. Sometimes, you know, like, it's like N1 if you do it properly, right? You can end the debate there. It doesn't matter what you can't do. That's why I love N1, right? You get up and you just destroy what they've said and put constructive material on the table. But in BP, you just have more time to do that, right? So that's what you, that's what you should be thinking to do. So this is what I mean by the first speech which should provide arguments which meet all of the burdens. So when you're thinking about how do we develop the case, you want to do this, right? This is when I really mean you shouldn't be self. I do DPM. Um, DPM is a frustrating position because if you've done your job properly, your partner goes out and gives a boss speech, right? Just a fantastic speech. You're sat there with nothing sometimes. Yeah. Because you've given them everything, especially at the higher level. Because when we say three arguments, sometimes, like two weeks ago in Leader of Opposition, I made eight arguments in a speech, right? Just sub points, like arguments which fall under a broader burden. If you make eight arguments in one speech, what the hell is the second speaker going to do, right? And they don't have very much. That's fine. Don't worry. Because what happens then is you can expand, rebuild, defend. Yes, sometimes you may just take lower speaker points because the, the judge is bad, right? He goes, oh, we heard that argument from the best speaker. Doesn't matter, right? If you win the round, who cares about speaker points? Everyone knows they're pretty negligible anyway. And also, if you do your job well, you will get credit. Good judges will go, yes, this person like, only brought one key argument. But like that justification, uh, in addition to like the defence of this, was exceptional, right? So when you think about how you should divide the points up, you will probably have in prep the thought of at least three vital points, right? Um, firstly, make sure that the first speaker has points to fulfil all of their burdens. But you should have like one key point left for the second speech, something which like says my speech is not a waste of time. Right? Apart from the fact I'm defending it. I know it sounds a bit silly, but it's to be honest, in my opinion, it's because just some judges are just gonna go, oh, this person hasn't like given substantive material. That's okay. poor judging, but a lot of judges judge like that. So it's important to say, look, in a so I often get up a DPM and I go, okay, I want to look at four things, right? Firstly, I want to have a look at like this mischaracterization of my partner's argument. AKA, I'm going to rebuild my partner's argument. Secondly, I'm going to further justify this principle, i.e. my partner didn't justify it enough, I'm going to justify it, right? Well, when I say i.e., obviously, it's not what I say, I'm just explaining to you what we're doing. Right. Thirdly, I'm going to look at this completely new argument, right? This argument of X, where, and then X is really important. And fourthly, I'm going to briefly look at some stakeholders in this debate who are important, right? You see how then what you've done is you've defended your partner, 
And that's the crux of your case. Essentially, the rest of your speech could be irrelevant. You can still win the debate. But you're going, look, we're not just good, we're brilliant, right? We're bringing you another argument as well to explain why this is a good thing. So in prep, that's how you should think about splitting it, right? Don't worry if the second speaker doesn't necessarily have anything. They will always have rebuttal. They will always have defending to do. And to be honest, like one was saying, sometimes if you're DLO, you've had at least 15 minutes, if it's five-minute speeches, to think up another argument. That's not that difficult. You will, especially with more experience, that won't be a problem at all, right? Sixth thing, right? This is very important. This is something um, like some of you may have done in KP when you help A1 write their case, yeah? You have to do this. Because the reason this is important is first and foremost, as Borja says, if the Prime Minister or Leader of Ops sits down <coughs> and the judge is like, either I don't understand or all of the main arguments come out in the second speech, you've lost, right? Because in the first case, it's just you're unclear, that's really bad, you've lost. Second one, it's, we call it um, backloading, right? You've been unfair. How on earth is the DPM going to respond to DLO's arguments? They can't, right? That's unfair, you've lost the game. Well, one of the worst things you can hear from a debater is, this is what we really wanted to say. <laughs> Let's say it the beginning, right? <laughs> I mean, of course, if you think of the second opposition, the, the opposition, the other side doesn't get you okay, but yeah. it should not be directed for the judges. Exactly, right? Exactly. So what you want to do, and, and so that's the first reason why you should do this. The second reason is, if you've helped, so say um, I go PM and Borna goes to PM, right? If he helps me write my speech, he doesn't need to listen to my speech, right? He knows what we're going to say, but what I'm going to say, but we wrote it together. That means he can focus on his speech. But the, that's good in itself. Right? But the reason it's also good is it makes it very easy for him to defend because we know exactly what the case is. Even at our level, sometimes, especially in closing, because it's harder, which like, we'll talk to you about in a bit, you don't really know what the extension is because you've had to write it quickly. It should never be an excuse top half. You should always know. The best debaters in the world will always tell you you write the first speech. It doesn't matter how good they are. right? Like, World champions still have their partners help their first speech right out, because that's where you win the debate, right? Then what I would say, so this is like about how you write it, kind of thing, like physically write it. Um, trees will be killed for it, use recyclable paper, right? But signpost one point per page, and an A4 page, right? This again sounds stupid, I'm sorry, but some of you it's quite obvious. I judge so many people who either get up with A5, right, and are like, uh, that, right? Bad. Lose the style, lose the flow, you lose the impact of your case. Because what you want to be doing in any position is, look, this is a really important issue. Listen to me. That's less persuasive when you're like, not really sure what I've written. Uh, give me a minute. You know, that's poor, right? The other reason it can be poor is if you put like three arguments on one page or two arguments. Because it's, again, the same problem, right? You're trying to link. Like, maybe you've thought new lines of analysis, you can't fit it in, you draw a line to another page, you leave it out, then you're like, oh crap, I forgot to mention it, and the partner hits you, it's bad, right? You can't do that. Uh, Sign costs one point per page. Right? So, then what you do, so this is actually, this will become quite useful here, right? Sorry. So, you may have, like, uh, so, why, this is often the first argument in any debate, why this is legitimate, right? Oops. Right? Shorthand. Okay? So that will be your title. You may, for example, have two reasons for why this is legitimate. Uh, legit. Sorry. So first one might be blah, 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 blah. Right? What you want to do then is you want to bullet point lines of analysis. Because what that does, you don't want to like have like your speech written down because you read that bad for the reasons I talked about earlier. You want to bullet point. So you can just look down and you know how your speech is going to flow. For all of you, this should be like normal, right? Any format of debate, you should be doing this. But what I would suggest is, so um, I have thought about this for a while, and I think this structure, spiel or peels, is quite effective, right? So a lot of you may be familiar with peel. Point, evidence, explain, link, yeah? Um, is anyone unsure of what any of those mean? Uh, just very quickly, link is very important in BP debates, often forgotten. Explain why your argument is relevant in this debate. It's not good enough to say, like, sometimes you get some brilliant philosophical arguments about why liberty is important. And I'm like, great, but you haven't told me why I should care about it in this debate, right? That's the L, very important. But what the S is, and what people always forget at any level, even like, if you watch some of the best debates in the world, some of the best rounds in the world, they forget the S. 
is what I call status quo, or essentially comparative, right? How does this argument relate to an argument on your other team, right? So, if you remember what I talked about earlier, I was like, this is more important than that argument, that's what I mean. Or something along the lines of, so, spiel, would look like, so, open, so you're, say I'm leader of all. So, opening, up, opening government have characterized this situation as blah, 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 blah. We dispute it. Right? Well, our point is this. Then you give your evidence and you explain within that why it's different to theirs and why yours is more important or more true or more important, ideally all of those three things. Right? So you follow that. Um, what I like to do sometimes as well, just at the end, just put an example, like, you know, like if you want to talk about Brazil or whatever, uh, Brazil, like, uh, or whatever, um, just so you remember to mention it. It shouldn't be coming out like the, the other speech. Uh, another thing when it comes to examples, just generally, but for this is very good. One. Think of examples, not because you need to prove something, but because examples will remind you how things that you're debating are mostly real world and have real world issues or problems on itself. So if you can find a good example, that can also help you because it can give you an idea for another argument, or it can point out that there's a lack of logic in your own argument. So think of example, then this is a really good, this is a really good thing. Like, write them big, put them on a paper, write A, X. You want to know them, you want to be reminded. You want to have in your head, oh yeah, like that Germany thing that happened. You know, you want to you wanna, you want to have uh, something on the paper, you want to have it visually to remind you, as well to remind you, to mention it, not to forget it. Exactly, and also what it does, it, it really contextualizes your analysis, right? Like, if you've given reasons for something to be true, it's always nice when you say, look, this is true in this scenario. But it's not enough just like you said, oh, like Brazil, right? That's bad, because it's like, I can shout out countries as well. Like, you need to explain that example. This is something which, in particular, in BP doesn't, isn't actually done very well. Like, in, sorry, yeah, just a couple of Okay, like, uh, we had a, uh, we had a part, uh, dead sentence, right? Debate. So we had an uh, economical argument, right? So if you have an economical argument, let's say, like in Karl Popper, you talk about it in the ideal, uh, ideal. Like, there's too much money, I don't want to be giving money to somebody who's going to be life sentence, I want to see him dead, I don't believe that we should spend money on murderers and rapists, they should be dead and dead. And, but when you give an example, if you want to give an example of that, you come to the case of realizing that that's actually not true, that people who are on death sentence are actually costing us more than people who are on life sentence. Right. And if you know that as an example, you will automatically start using your using your reasoning. You will look and you say, "Oh wait, what does that mean?" All oh, that means is they have a lot of appeals, but that also is connected with the argument of are are is the justice system really trying to figure out who's guilty and who's not guilty? Who will kill, will we kill an innocent person? Because apparently it's connected. Because you can say, "Oh my God!" But that means that every person who's sentenced to death actually has like five appeals, so the system is not that bad as a government or opposition thing. So examples are there, so they will not just uh, uh, be connected with the argument you're talking about, but they're definitely connected with the argue other arguments. Because the thing is, that if you're a prime minister, plan to be a prime minister, and there's a case, or an argument, a plan, a new law that you're trying to pass in the parliament, then given an example, it has to be connected with all the other arguments. Because it's reality, so examples will help you. You know, seek good examples. There you go. That's it. I think we're not quite. Yeah, uh, we're very near the end anyway. Um, so essentially, so then the last two things on this, right, is um, to give you a vague idea of where you should be in prep time. After 11 minutes or so, so like, so go on over by talking, and he's uh, so I'm PM. I should have about at least like one and a half of my three points written out, right? Generally, my third argument is going to be less important than my first or second argument. But you still need to get to that. Um, so that at this point, what Vilna should do is go, okay, do I understand? I'll go, yes, I know what we discussed for this, great. Then he goes and he tries to think of something more and start writing the first point of his speech, right? Which he should already have, like you should split it already. If you haven't, don't worry, I should take that. This is the time when he should be thinking of something. Then I finish writing my speech, he does things, right? Unsurprisingly, this is not that different for second half, right? So this, I'm just gonna, what we'll do is we'll cover the, um, so sometimes very briefly what you like, what you can do, which I wouldn't suggest you do at this point, this is a, like, maybe like after a little bit more time debating, you say if and I spoke together, what we often do is go, how do we think in closing, we may go, how do we think this is going to happen top half? The Bonner will go, Prop will probably say this, 
Off will probably respond with that. Then I'm like, yeah, this gap will probably be left out. Um, no one will probably mention this because it doesn't seem that important. Um, what we've done there is we've already thought of some ways of that, like extending, right? We may we would want to fill this gap. Uh, we may want to like uh, bring this new argument in, and also we know the key argument. So if one of the earlier teams forgets to mention it, great, we're going to mention it, right? Um, and I also and also again looking out and looking really hard to the second part of the table is uh, listening. I mean, there's a read before before you start all the debating. Extension used to be something that can also be a mechanism. In some countries, it's still being debated. Mechanism. That, that was thrown out because of very logical reason. That means that first government goes out and says, this is our plan. The, second, the first opposition goes out and says, yeah, but your plan is causing this problem to happen. And then the second, op second government will stand up and say, yes, but we will do another thing. We will implement another law also, solving your problem that you mentioned. It wasn't a debate. So actually, that means that uh, uh, you don't have mechanisms to try to take care of the second part. But examples can help you, and listening to the debate can help you. So first opposition sometimes, or the first government, can give you new arguments for the second part that you didn't think, that didn't think about at all. So listening is probably the biggest thing that can help you develop a good argument for the second half if you don't have already something that you understand. Excellent. Exactly. And just like linking this to what we were saying a second ago. For example, the PM often goes, oh, I've got three arguments. Then, like, the third argument, say it's a five-minute speech, I start at four minutes, 45. Then the DPM drops it because the partner hasn't mentioned it. Which means that you can run that argument, right? Like, especially if you're lacking material, it's probably a really good thing to do. Or, like, some rounds, like, you've explained, you know that argument I said I gave eight, eight points in? Obviously, I couldn't explain eight points very well, right? I explained four very, like, four solidly, four less good. Closing team took one of them, ran an extension, and they took a second, right? Um, this I've just, we've already discussed. Um, and very briefly, this is uh, like something you can do in fact, right? So this is a suggestion. So some people like to make a list of the different arguments, right, that you've thought of. And then as the debate's going on, essentially kind of cross it out, like ones which have been said in a lot of detail, because you don't want to extend on that, because you, know, that you don't want to get credit. Another way is like a thematic spider diagram, right? So you have your different stakeholders, you know, you're like, all like, you know, legit legitimacy, efficacy, like, how does this affect women, uh, ethnic minorities, media, or whatever, depending on the debate, international relations, and then off that you draw arguments, and then you do the same thing, right? That's another way of doing it. Um, things which will help, just write down key lines of analysis, examples, right? for the reasons we've already said. Those will help you build a case, especially in closing. When, like, let's be honest, if you, especially like in fresher year, in my first year, there were lots of times where I didn't have an extension because the team ahead of me has said what I was going to say because we were all roughly the same level, they say it, and I'm like, oh, crap, right? So sometimes, like, like we've said, an example could be brilliant. You can build a case around an example, right? Or you just like key lines of analysis which you fill in and you take a second, or even a first if it's pivotal. Um, Nine, right? Find whatever way is suitable for you to differentiate on your sheet or spider diagram. Which arguments have been taken? Which arguments have not been taken? Which arguments are vital and, like, if they've not been taken, you have to run it, right? If your opening government forgets to show why this is legitimate, you'd be surprised how many do this. They get up and go, this is why it leads to good things. Then you win the debate by going, we completely agree it leads to good things, but we should probably show to you first and foremost that this is okay to do. Uh, then you win, right? So stuff like that to be aware. And lastly, consider broad, like briefly, what do we think the clash is here? Because if you know what the clash is, which is generally the burdens, right? Like some people say they're true, some people say they're false, right? Then you again you know roughly where the debate's going to go and how to build your case. So that actually covers what we wanted to cover. Um, does anyone have any questions? No, great. I think we'll have any questions later asked. Yeah, just come find us.